Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back. It's League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you to wrap up the recap ranking countdown of T1 slash SKT. We're into the bot lane going through 80 carries and supports in the history of T1 and SKT. And truthfully, I mean, at least when you look at AD carry, that has been the second most consistent position in the history of the organization. The rankings for ADC and supports are going to be a little bit different than what we've experienced. I mean, obviously, mid lane is its own separate thing going through the history of T1, SKT, and the, and the mega players for the organization. Jungle and top, you had a lot more names to sift through and go through. ADC and support, it's pretty stable for the T1 organization as you look through the history. There are a couple, you know, little ones popping here and there to talk about, but you got some big time dogs to talk about when you're talking about the top three for the respective positions. And we start with uh, a trivia shout out for the true fans in AD Carry because you had a guy who suited up for three games in 2018 summer. It was Leo, who was hyped up as an up and coming young AD Carry, never quite lived up to that hype, but he did pick up a dub on the Vladimir bot lane. You remember 2018 summer market was when the awesome dude carries were hanging out in the bot lane. Oh, baby, do I ever remember that era of League of Legends. And Leo was one that stepped up to the plate. He was someone that I think a lot of people, more so for the traditional ADCs, were keeping an eye on in the T1 Academy system and growing up, wanted to see that potential realized, obviously comes through in this awesome dude's carry meta. Mixed results, I think, of, of course, with T1, even in such an incredibly small sample size, you do get the strong performance on that. Vladimir, to get that win, as you mentioned, is the important trivia note to keep a reminder of about leo's time with t1 then it's actually you know there's really 480 carries to talk about i'm sorry leo we're not including you in that top four uh pedigree of skt t1 a world champion in that four spot and i know most people probably more so remember piglet for his time on Team Liquid and in North America, which is an absolute travesty. Because when you go back to Season 3 and 4, especially that 2013 World Championship, everybody talked about the debut faker, his main stay on the big stage. But Piglet was an absolute masterclass throughout that world's run. That's kind of the craziest thing, going back and looking at that World Championship for T1. And of course, with that knowledge and the memory that a lot of our fans will share of recognizing Piglet for his time with Team Liquid, with Clutch Gaming and, and, and the sorts. <laughs> Shivers. And, but you're robbed of the monster he was back in 2013. If you're focusing on that recent end towards his career, or if you're just looking at the faker effect of that world championship, because there is no mistaking, you don't get across that finish line without the mega damage and skills coming across from Piglet in that bot lane early. And I know 2014, things kind of started falling off. But again, the first half of that at All-Stars, and I think the winter split when they won, Piglet was absolutely still a premier AD carry. He was still a few months removed from forgetting to even get runes in his debut in the LCS. I think it's a great example that even being a monster, even showing all that potential, all that skill and talent, there's other factors that will play in or can influence a player's career and how it goes and the environment that you're in. For a player like Piglet, the move, the transition to North America, I think a lot of people can look back and say that was not the environment that was going to support and push you to that next level of competition in your career. And that is the story of Piglet. Especially 2015 LCS when it was even more for fun. If you can believe it, more for fun than we're talking about in the modern LCS days. Number three spot for AD carries is the only guy now on this list who does not have a world championship to his name when it comes to AD carries. But from the minute there was the hype announcement for that 2019 SKT roster, Teddy never did anything wrong and lived up to the expectations and hype that he got. He got benched because the guys higher than him on this list who ended up being one of the best AD carries that we've seen in a long time. But Teddy's tenure on T1 was fantastic. There's no shame in Teddy's tenure on T1, and it absolutely is criminal that it ended without a big time championship, without, uh, you know, th this way to encapsulate it all and everything that went right. You don't really have that big stamp on it like you do with some of these other members of T1 that you go through in the history of such a successful organization. 
looking at Teddy's time, this was a big thing, as you mentioned, that offseason, bringing him in, this was recognized right away as one of these players with immense potential and talent that was being wasted, languished down with the Jin Air Green Wings, bringing him in to a winning organization, a formula like T1. This was exactly that re rejuvenation that the T1 fan base really needed after some down years, 2018, you know, you know, of course, the end of 2017, 2018, how that all plays out, trying to recapture you know, roster shuffle, everything else. Teddy comes in and provides that instant star power, that instant boost to that bottom lane that was desperately missing it without someone like Bang in that role. And they were, at times, even, you know, there were slumping moments in 2019 and beyond. Because remember, Teddy was, it was basically three years that he was with this organization. And there were countless times where he was carrying some of these games in a 1v9 scenario on the Ezreal picks. He's still at Barrett's on Barris. He had some fantastic individual performances across the board. And I think we forget because of what Guma ended up becoming, but... When Teddy was initially getting benched for games, sometimes even in playoffs, people, fans, analysts alike were saying, how are you going to pull Teddy out for this rookie in such a marquee game? That's how good Teddy was playing. And one of the things that Teddy really did offer was consistency in that bottom lane. There was no, not really many times where you're finding he's getting set behind type of situation. It was either even and then he's going to find an advantage or you've already got that advantage and they're going to push it forward type of thing. Teddy was a beast for T1. There's no mistaking it. You look at that first initial split and a season type of thing. There's like 95 plus type of wins, like 45 ish type of losses type of thing. Continues even more so to the next year. And even when you're looking at the champions that I think a lot of people might be forgetting, got to look at that Callista season 10, rocking about an 80, 85 percent win rate on that champion. Teddy was a real deal in the bot lane. And eventually, when he did fully lose that starting spot uh, to Guma. Everyone was saying, okay, well, this guy's way too good to be wasted sitting on the bench. He immediately ended up getting another starting spot. And even Mr. Big Dog Joe Marsh was saying, we'll do whatever we can to get Teddy a spot. He's such a likable dude, great teammate, and again, way too talented to not be a starter. He was still like the fourth best AD carry in the league. Guma just kind of came in and had a pretty damn big impact on the entire league. The number two spot is... Honestly, a guy I didn't think could be usurped as best AD carry in SKT T1 history. That is, of course, Bang. Another guy who was criminally underrated, saying he just coasted alongside Faker and the gang during that dynasty. But for it to be a dynasty, everybody has to be world class. And how many highlights are there of Bang playing Lucian with four support characters just propping this dude up? It's criminal that people want to bring down, tear down the legacy that someone like Bang has built and earned with T1, very rightfully so. You look at this player, you look at obviously the trophy cabinet that we can all talk about and look at the, the championships, the LCK titles, MSI, all these wonderful things. I think the biggest one is, of course, how he played throughout these games and you're looking through that track record for T1 all throughout the splits, all the big moments. My man, he is right there and there, right through the thick and thin of it with Faker and the rest of SKG. Multiple metas, multiple different champions that became synonymous with this guy. It wasn't just the Lucian. When the Ash and Jin meta came over, he piloted those two world championships. He was setting records. Uh, at, I think it was the 2015 world championship when he had a 73 KDA. And keep in mind, when SKT were dominating, there were some absolutely premier bottom lanes. We've seen him go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Uzi, against Ruler and Core JJ at times throughout these years. Prey and Gorilla. Him and Wolf were more than holding their own and more often than not getting the better of these other world-class bot lanes. So never be sleeping on this bot lane for SKT. The way that they did damage and held back the likes of Prey and Gorilla. Arguably one of the best duos that we've ever seen, especially in the LCK. Bang and Wolf, time and time again, even if you individually or together would rate them lower than what you thought about Prey and Gorilla, they found an answer. They found a way to get it done with the rest of the squad. That is big value for me. Bang's championships that he brought in. You know, you've mentioned the champions and how he well he adapted to it. A lot of people forget Twitch. Twitch was a big champion for him. He was really lethal on that rat. Arguably, I think, in my opinion, the best Twitch we've ever seen for the T1 organization. By the way, how about 50% of these AD carries 
had a little stint in NA that maybe people ended up their careers leaving a bit of a sour taste in their mouths, but still no question, bang, one of the best 80 carries of all time. It just so happens that this guy who ended up stealing Teddy's spot as the starter ended up being one of the most exciting, mechanically talented players that we have ever seen. You can remove the AD carry role because Gumayushi from when he was debuting and seemingly getting almost a pentakill every couple of games, his hype has only intensified peaking with what he did at that 2023 World Championship. Truly one of the premier prodigies we've seen. The premier prodigy and one with the confidence of Whew. a legendary champion. You love to see it from Mr. Guma Yushi getting into a bit of the trash talk, of course, and backing it up with the gameplay as the number one ADC in the T1 SKT history. Yes, it is an important one to look through and especially great that we've had this chance to kind of talk about, of course, Piglet, almost the very beginning, you get a championship and then you move up to, to someone like Teddy and you're talking about great individual results, but not necessarily that big stamp. Bang, you're rolling through with multiple stamps everywhere you can about championships type of things. How do you top it? You do the combination. You start putting those stamps down for Guma of these world championships, of these LCK finals that they're rolling in through MSI events, everything else like that. And then you roll through the individual performance. You're running through the win rates on these champions. The career win rate for this guy is like 67, 68%, which is pretty nuts. So when you're thinking about the type of games that you've been playing and the level that you're having to play at 4T1. And the ebbs and flows roller coaster that Guma's already had in such a young career there were you know the 18 and 0 season with t1 they were hyping up everyone was hyping up this bot lane and then they underperform at msi and you're saying ah maybe guma's already peaked but i mean maybe he peaks but this guy looks like he has about five or six different peaks that he's going to be hitting because yeah the world championship in 2023 went to another level we've seen him when faker was out of the lineup he was pretty much the only guy still playing at an incredibly high level so we've seen 1v9 performances when the team is struggling and we've seen him bring up the level of the rest of this all-star cast champions like Zaya, Jinx, Caitlyn, you know, of course, rocking well over, you know, 75, 80% win rates on those champions. The one that I think a lot of people would be sleeping on, eight or 10 games on Senna, rocking about that 80, you know, 90% win rate. My man, he's good on one of these other champions. The problem with that and identifying it is saying, well, now you're taking him away from being more or less that ADC damage threat that we all know and love throughout those stages. That is the threat. Guma plays on that edge so many times. And I got to say, without question in my mind right now, the best Varus that we've got on the planet. My man is insanely lethal with those. Whether it's trying to take your life or trying to take a dragon or baron away from you, he's got it. And not just that, he's got the fancy footwork on it like we just saw against JDG, turning him into fools as he eliminates him. 300 APM machine gun Varus YouTube title videos coming out of Gooba uh, <laughs> on that Varus pick that we have seen. Then we get to the buddies in the bot lane. Supports, again, a pretty consistent, for the most part, position in the history of the organization. We start with a, a little bonus SKT Peekaboo. I bet you he didn't know. He played 12 games for them in the spring split. Obviously, this guy at one time was a really hyped up uh, support, more so with KT Rollster than when he was on SKT, but played a few games before Wolf kind of took over that starting spot. But the big names, obviously, again, that 2019 hyped roster, when you had the GOAT at the time support Mata coming over, it was incredibly hyped up. And again, this is the guy to highlight we're ranking purely based on their time with SKT. Yes, you look at Mata's career as a whole, of course, he's way higher than number five, but he was just there for one year on SKT and didn't even play that much the second half of the year. I think we're entering a, a time and territory where we could have a conversation if you do want to consider the whole careers, if he would even be better than the number one in this type of list. No, the answer is no for me, but we'll get there. <laughs> that, that's a scary thing to think about, but we'll get there in due time. Yes, Mata's time with T1 was a big big acquisition at the time it certainly was viewed as someone towards the end of his playing career but well respected in what he was going to bring not just on the rip but especially off the rip to this t1 lineup to an organization with baker already there of course that excitement had been there and it builds up and it does it does equal success of course the only problem here when you're looking at mata's run it's a very short success because it's a success success excuse me for that spring split 
And then everything starts to come out undone towards at MSI. And then especially towards that summer split where effort is replacing him in the starting line. And that's why you look at that four spot, you have effort ahead of him. You might, how do you have effort? He had some bad games on T1 and his career kind of fell off a cliff after that time on T1. But he took the starting spot from Mata. How can you put him lower? He played 12 of the 14 games. That's right. Mata only played two games at the World Championship in 2019. And effort was on T1 three full years, basically. Whereas Mata, again, 2019 as a whole. So effort, you're looking at the SKT career, 100% he's higher than Mata. Yeah, if, of course, just for this type of list, when it is an SKT focus, you're going to have some like effort find this spot. And it really is one of those ones where I think people either have a very mixed opinion about effort and his time with T1 because there was a lot of up and downs. There's a lot of roller coaster movement individually in his performance. You know, had some mega plays. You're looking at the Rakan, one of the best Rakans without question that we have seen for the T1 organization, the playmaking, the creativity, of course, that elusiveness, that frustrating aspect of Rakan, where he can get in, get in a mega play, and you start to blow him up, but then he just shifts out of the way and you can't finish off that kill. Effort was fantastic at that line for T1 is one of the big things that you look at. Of course, there are some downtimes. That is the other thing I think a lot of people are gonna be looking at some, some misplays, some struggling moments, some downtimes as well some of the worst times I think for effort to really capitalize that would have pushed this era of T1 closer to that elite status that we're at right now coming hot fresh off that world championship and that's why he can't crack that top three ahead of the most underrated player from that 2013-2014 era it is the captain of the 100 acre bottom lane Mr. Pooh Man Do if you haven't seen some of this guy's clips a true pioneer of the early support days and basically made support Zyra as broken as it has been over the years. Yes, T1 SKT Zyra coming on through, Mr. Pooh Man Do. Yes, love him in the bottom lane. And I think as much as we talked about Piglet and how impactful he was as a monster performer for that 2013 SKT, when you really look at it and you say, yes, there's a lot of you know things factoring in here to that early run, Pooh Man Do's consistency in that lane is absolutely one that you cannot overlook what he was able to do that presence that he had there that uh you know relationship that he had with piglet to get the very best out of them earlier in their career that's a very big thing i think uh, that gets overlooked in the value that Pooh mandu brought to the skt organization then we want to talk also underrated how about the engages of mr wolf one of the most likable charismatic players that skt has ever had and you know we're gonna roll the clip so we gotta shout out the 10k comeback from edg it's wolf not faker's shockwave that finds them all oh my god as much as i love talking about effort as the best for Khan we've seen for t1 hey wolf makes a pretty darn case with some mega plays and of course no play mega more mega than this one that you see right there Wolf, Mr. T1. T1 to his core. I'm sure he'd be bleeding T1 red. My man has got it going on for the organization. He's been this long stay. And when you look at the performances, there actually is, a, you know, a spot in this list and a deserving spot on top of all the other T1 love and accolades that go with Mr. Wolf and the stamps of the world championships. You're looking at the play. You're looking at the Braum, the Nami plays. This guy was fantastic on those two champions specifically for me. Even and the Alistar, I'll throw it in there. Well, he's played engaged champions like the Alistar, flashing over walls on Zyra, and we've also seen him on things like Nami and Karma. So the key to longevity in this game is being able to play multiple play styles and survive multiple metas. That is exactly what we highlighted with Bang and the same thing with Wolf. Those guys go hand in hand with why that bot lane was so successful for three years. And a lot of people forget about that Karma pick. I'm glad that you brought that one up. That one is incredibly lethal from Wolf. He was rocking around over an 80% win rate on that Karma uh, at certain seasons. And certainly one of those ones where it ruined the playing with Karma supports for me because I'd be watching games and I'd see what he was able to do, how annoying he was able to be on that Karma. My solo queue supports ain't doing that. But of course, you can't hold him to the Wolf standard. That's crazy. Yeah, not especially in the ELO you and I are playing in. Uh, you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no question. But uh, multiple picks. Wolf, absolutely one of the most consistent, even though, again, towards the end of his time on SKT, it was dipping a bit. You had two full years where he was one of the best supports in the world. The problem for him, 
is this next guy's been the best support in the world for three plus years undisputed one of the most i'm gonna say the most exciting support player to watch that we have ever seen it is kiria who has now been with the squad for three plus years you could spend an hour plus just going through highlights of this guy doing disgusting things on champions like tom kenshin braum even I, I love looking at this support list and realizing where Mata is and then kind of my in, you know view of it and looking at Mata as one of these guys that is a game changer for the era that he played in and how things evolved. I think Kiri is in that same type of vein just because he is that good and that flexible in his champion pool is another aspect that of course that he brings to the table over the top of guys. You know, we're talking about an era of this support position. You're looking all the way back at, you know, Lemonation carrying a book to actually have it draft and have stuff written out and stats and, you know, knowing what they want to draft and ban out type of way. You move over to Mata. You've got someone making these incredible plays, the thresh and making, an, you know, the predictions on the flash hooks, everything else. And then you move to Kyria and you've got that next level. My man's busting out. Caitlyn support, Yasuo, Camille, you know, whatever. Vera support, Ash support. He's got them all. But even when he's going traditional, he's got the skills to back it up, the playmaking, the creativity. We could gush forever about Kyria. He is without question the best support in T1 history. And he's putting himself in that running for the best support of all time without question. I, I would be hard to be swayed away from him already being in that number one spot even from guys like Mata, because, I mean, you saw glimpses of this on DRX, but he's only transcended to new heights since he joined this T1 roster and him and Guma combined. Now you look at this list as a whole and you're basically all five current versions of T1. You could be having at the very least in that conversation as the best in their role within this absolutely stacked organization, which truly means we are in the second era, second golden age of this T1 dynasty, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you so much for joining us on this journey, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.